today I want to ask you to not just imagine it with your eyes, but feel in your hearts this world that we are going to build together for all. The world that you are going to invent, the world you will engineer, the world you will innovate. If we don't feel it, we may believe it, but will we take the risks? So I want you to close your eyes. I know it's a beautiful museum, but I want you to close your eyes and I want to imagine. So let's say it's 2024. That happens to be the end of the decade of sustainable energy for all at United Nations, but you don't need to know that. We're in Warsaw, it's springtime. Of course, Poland won the World Cup in 2022 in Doha, playing in these beautiful zero carbon refrigerated stadiums designed and built by Dan Foss. No, you've got to feel this, you've got to feel this. Your house powers everything, it powers your car, powers the community, the district systems power the swimming pools at every, at every corner of every street. Your commute to work is quick. Your commute to work is clean. You don't drive. Your children go to a school, newly built, which uses 5% of the energy that the school that you went to used. Asthma rates have fallen by 70%. You don't have to worry about your daughter anymore. She seems to have grown out of that terrible phase that she went through when she was a baby. Life is good. You've just come back from a business trip. You were in Niger, a country you hadn't even heard of when you were growing up. It was dusty, it was desertified, it was poor. But now, it's green. You were there looking at the circular energy systems in a town that now has a full range of health clinics working night and day. Maternal mortality rates dropped by a half because now nurses can practice. It's safe to perform procedures because there is reliable, affordable, clean energy. There's no risk that the generator will go out. You remember the stories that you were told of what life was like here before you started this project. Last month, you were in Southeast Asia, at the top of a building, a green building, and you were looking at the new highly advanced building materials, all made from food waste within 10 miles of the city. The entire building that you stood on top of was made from things that, when you went to university, were considered waste. Now open your eyes. This is within our grasp. But the people who make decisions about what is taught in university, the people who make decisions about where the budget is spent, the people who make decisions about targets and goals and things like that, they don't quite believe it yet. They can't see it like you can, and they can't feel it like you must. This is me. I'm the one that's looking slightly scared and won't come out right on top. <laughs> this was taken two summers ago, about an hour and a half from here. It was a beautiful summer's day, and the wind was blowing gently. The winds of time have blown in many directions across Poland, 
for centuries. And it's right and proper that we're here in Warsaw today because from events like this, we have to shape the winds of change going forward again. I love this photograph for another reason. I am the daughter of an electrical engineer. My, some of my fondest childhood memories are sitting in the car with the maps of the transmission lines showing where the pylons were, and with my father pretending that I was the map reader and I was going to get him to whichever substation he needed to be working on. And I am now the daughter-in-law of a mechanical engineer, somebody whose heritage comes from this part of the world and who lived the American dream and retired as an emeritus professor of mechanical engineering and who has worked in design workshops on the materials used in those blades to make them so efficient. So, as the mother of a young man and a young, and a young girl, both of whom have the aptitude for engineering if they so wish, this for me is personal as well as political. We will build this better future. So let me put your invention in context. In 2015, in 2015, the world agreed a remarkable framework for the future. It agreed that we would, by 2030, have a world which would have realized a set of sustainable development goals, 17 sustainable development goals. The seventh of those goals was one related to sustainable energy. Everyone, the entire international community, agreed that we would, by 2030, be able to have sustainable energy for all. And what sustainable really means is affordable, reliable, and, and clean. That we would be able to improve the rate of energy efficiency, we'd be able to double the rate of energy efficiency improvement, and that therefore by 2030 we would be in a wholly different place from an energy efficiency perspective, and that we must double the amount of renewable energy in the energy mix. The international community then also agreed, at the end of 2015, the Paris Climate Change Agreement, which most people have heard of. But when you put that agreement together with these development goals, we have set ourselves a profound challenge, but one which we all agree on. The Paris Climate Agreement says that we will manage the economy in balance with the chemistry of the planet so that we limit warming to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. In fact, the political winds at that time urged an agreement that would get us to 1.5 degrees of warming, and this year the scientific community will, at the end of the year, report out on what will it take to get to 1.5 degrees. Can we do that? Now, you all know that that was a, 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 a unanimous agreement. Now, perhaps there's a little bit of doubt on the edges from one major power, but the world is moving on on that basis. But let me put all of that in shorthand for you. The shorthand is that we have effectively agreed that by 2030, we will have gone a long way to decarbonize the energy system of the future. And in so doing, we will have had to decentralize the energy system of the future, and we will have used the technologies available to us. We will have digitalized the energy systems of the future. And this is where I want to call upon you to think and feel differently about this challenge, because if we decarbonize our energy systems 
and have that drive the decarbonisation of the economy if we decentralise our energy systems and if we digitalise our energy systems, you will be revolutionaries. Because what you will have done, what you will have participated in, is the democratisation of energy systems. Because remember, when you closed your eyes and you're living in your apartment in Warsaw in 2024, you're providing energy. You are not a passive recipient of a centralised, fossil fuel-powered energy grid where the decisions about pricing are made by bureaucrats a long, long way away from you. No. You are revolutionaries as well as engineers. Revolutionaries as well as visionaries. So let's talk about efficiency in this context. It's the piece of the mix that doesn't really get the respect it deserves. But we don't talk about it as if it is this revolutionary and exciting concept. It's sort of, oh yeah, energy efficiency. And then the energy efficiency people go into a room to talk about it. Energy efficiency is the solution for these children's future. This school was built completely differently and built with completely different materials. The concepts of efficiency have been used to allow a generation of children to be educated. Efficiency is the way in which we will be able to breathe more easily. It is the future to your children's health. It is not a dry concept of equations. It is not for textbooks. It's not for small side conversations in big conferences. It is the heart of the matter. I was talking to policymakers the other week who said to me, you know, why are you focusing on cooling? One big piece, the thermal economy, thinking thermally, very big piece of the challenge ahead of us. And the question was put in the, in the context of, you know, this isn't a development issue. This isn't something that you should be worrying about. Getting an air conditioner for every middle class person in China is not the priority for a development conversation. Being able to secure cooling efficiently without using HFCs is going to be the future productivity of that young population living in that city that is growing so fast in Africa and Asia. It is going to be the future of that young person's ability to work, their productivity, their well-being depends upon our ability to bring cooling solutions to them. Their medicines, their food, their nutrition security, whether or not they can eat well and healthily, depends upon our ability to bring cooling solutions. Efficiency is sexy. And I ask you to put the sexy back into efficiency and talk about it in a different way. Policy matters. Nobody expects you to do everything. It is extraordinary to me that almost, well, just over half of the world's economy is still not governed by really strong efficiency standards. You need those. They will allow you to go even further faster. They will allow you to do more with less. They will allow you to make more profit. They will allow you to be able to move this planet move more, more quickly forward. And we have to sort out why it is that governments and policymakers would leave money on the table, as it were, by not putting that forward. So policy matters. Policy matters here in the developed world as well. There's a huge difference within the EU, within the OECD countries, within developed economies, between the best performers and the least best performers. If every country in the EU was as efficient as the most efficient economy, we would see a lot of the arguments at the European Council and in the Commission and in uh, meetings of the European Union disappear because we would be achieving the rates of progress we need to be achieving. 
So embracing positive deviance, being able to copy what the best team is able to achieve, has to be a way that we think about speeding up the dissemination of our ideas, our techniques, our technologies, our business models. So policy matters and finance matters. Our financial system today does not put a value on thrift. Not thrift in that we would deny people those things that they aspire to. It's not that only the well-off should be able to have all the appliances and gadgets and things that they need to live comfortably. The point is that with energy efficiency, everybody can have those things, but running off much less energy. But the idea that we can do more for more people with less is not built into the financial systems today, and they do not see a value in demanding efficiency yet of their customers and of their, their investees. And we are going to have to bring this conversation together so that those of us who see that, see that it is possible and see the value in this will be able to bring the financiers along with us. So policy matters, finance matters, and then the idea that efficiency will mean more equity in our economy, that those on lower income, that those who are marginalized, that those that live below and beyond the power lines, those for whom the energy system has never worked until this day, that they will be able to get the cooling that they need to be comfortable, the cooling that they need to secure their food supply, the heating they need to be able to study in school when it gets cold in winter, that people will be able to be lifted up because we can be more efficient with the use of our resources. This is the context of your work. This is why you can feel as well as see what the future is. And this is why I ask you to be passionate pioneers of the future of a more circular economy, the future of a designed economy that works for everyone. So I have some requests of you. One, ask different questions and take the time to ask the question differently. Put different people in the room with you to find the answers because by serving the person who is traditionally unserved, we will find answers for everyone. Don't take no for an answer. Shout if the policymakers don't get it. Focus on education of the financial system and imagine tomorrow, today, and build it with your heart as well as with your head. Thank you. You, you don't get away that easy. <laughs> <laughs> you've come a long way, you've braved flight delays. Um, allow us a couple of questions, please. Absolutely. The, the thing that I find possibly most puzzling in uh, conversations about the definition of sustainability and what to do is that we quite often consider silos, thematic silos um, of finance, management, uh, engineering, uh, with a view to success within those silos. Ultimately, we are still all going to be working in those silos, but then maybe with a bit of luck from a perspective of a broader context that sustainability is not a thing to work towards, but it is the thing that actually is at the, uh, the f you know, fundament yeah. of all of this. It, how do we get there? How do we cross the chasm of understanding other than small steps and lots of them? What, what do you do on a daily basis to make <laughs> this happen? Well, I think, I think that most... Um, so I think that the people who have the power to make decisions which would allow progress to go at greater speed and at greater scale can't see round the corner. They, they can't see what you can see. They can't see what is already being built or what might be being built. 
uh, or what is possible. And so they are faced with a decision where they think that they are going to take a big risk for a possible return or less risk for a certain return. And creating the atmosphere uh, you know, in your town, in your community, in a country or internationally, whereby the policymakers will take the risk because they believe it can be built. That's something we've learned how to do, but we don't do it very often. And in my experience, what works the best is you don't talk about energy, you don't talk about engineering, you don't talk about design or buildings, or anything. you talk about kids. And you talk about families, and you talk about what you want for those who come, come next. And you talk about children's health, you talk about um, your aspirations for their education, for their well-being, for the well-being of the community, for the kind of food that you want them to be able to eat and things like that. And that, that's something that every policymaker can relate to. And I think the best sort of, the best politicians, the best um, business leaders, the best community leaders and activists do that, and they do that very well. And frankly, that's what it's all about. So when the, minister, the Prime Minister of Rwanda spoke to me just a few weeks ago about we've got to be able to get everybody cooking cleanly in Rwanda, that's because they face terrible deforestation if they don't fix the problem. But they have terrible problems of, of health from, from breathing in dirty air, and um, they all want something better for their children. Well, if we look at, if we look at uh, the entire architecture of the problem, then we can see that, it, that air pollution and um, energy poverty and high costs and all those things, they're all actually part of the same picture. Uh, but uh, depending on the geographic location and your context, you kind of, you're only seeing bits of it. Um, are you, have you seen encouraging signs of... Uh, let's say politicians other than you know, people in the, in the UN who, who, whose job it is to look at the whole picture, but uh, local politicians realizing that their picture is merely a, you know, a, a component of the larger picture. No, I, th I think there are, <clears throat> there's extraordinary, there are extraordinary things happening all over the world and extraordinary uh, advances happening all over the world. It's linking it all up so that it just is, is going much faster, which I think is the, the issue now. So uh, I showed a picture of the, uh, of the Medina in uh, Marrakesh. You know, Morocco has gone from being an energy poor economy to being you know, an extraordinary example of renewable energy at scale with the ability to export that energy across the whole of North Africa and of course into Europe if the EU would, you know, get things sort of sorted out. Mm. So, you know, one, two, Chile, Argentina, massive uh, improvements in, in the way in which they think about their energy future and extraordinary regulatory reforms, which are showing a big impact. The rate of energy efficiency improvement in China and India is actually quite stunning, coming from a very, very low base, but that's the race against a future urbanized society which is choking people. Mm. Um, you know, inside the EU. Denmark, of course, is the poster child for an energy productivity that most countries still only aspire to. And across, you know, the United States and the rest of Europe, you see communities becoming truly, um, or the beginning of the journey of becoming circular. Mm -hmm. So lots to be really excited about. But how do you make that a tidal wave? I think that's the challenge for us. So perhaps actually connecting this to the, the question which we have uh, uh, before us, how can normal people get involved? Um, uh, it seems as though normal people actually have quite a lot of power in terms of uh, connecting and, and, and somehow pushing this, this, this wave forward, or this wave that you talk about. So, um, so I think the, the opportunities to get involved are really uh, locally and, and nationally. Um, if, if your country is uh, not able to explain to you how they are going to provide affordable, reliable, and clean energy, and you need clean because if not, then they are going to be passing on to your children some very big debts 
uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, then you need to be engaged with organisations that are in that fight. At the local level, there's much that local communities can do to now take some of their energy future into their own hands. Everything from... Uh, you know, uh, bio um, generation and waste collection through to, you know, mixing grid and off-grid at the local level through to community efforts to become more efficient. Uh, if, like in my country, you've taken your eye off the ball on building efficiency, um, then you are not investing in low-income people and elderly people who, you know, can do much better with much more efficient homes. Uh, we can build social housing that's super efficient and everybody benefits within the economy from that. So I, I think that there is much that you can do, but we have to demand that our policy makers will listen to these communities, to the communities of people who can build things and make the, the revolution that's already underway more possible. So get involved. If you want to get involved globally, um, email me at rachel at seforall.org and I'll find a way to hook you up somehow. I'm sure you can find a job for them. Do we have one more question for Rachel? There you go. We probably have more than one, but you know, time, time is, is running. Uh, what happens after we achieve sustainable energy for all, considering policymakers meet their targets by 2030? Hmm. Hopeful. Possible? Well, so this is, this is a goal which is technologically more or less within grasp, right? Which financially is possible. The only potential break on achieving clean, affordable, reliable energy for all people is our own ambition, our own politics, and our own choice of leaders. The technology is there and is evolving so rapidly that we can't even quite keep up sometimes. And young people are fed up. Young people don't understand why it's a choice between clean air and a job and a good education. I mean, they want all of that. And if that has to be recalibrated, then that's what they want. And so uh, for me, I think this is one of the achievable goals. It's not going to be easy. Maybe we don't hit it on 31st of December 2029, 20, uh, but we hit it there or thereabouts. But the main obstacle is our own lack of imagination. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Rachel Kite. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.